Hello, everyone, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak with you. Uh, I am Drew Cheney, one of the field application scientists with Roche Sequencing and Life Sciences, uh, and I'm based out of the New England area. Uh, today, uh, I will discuss the RNA-seq and uh, our portfolio and how Kappa RNA HyperKit, a streamlined workflow that delivers high quality sequencing performance, addresses associated challenges in next generation sequencing library preparation for RNA. Uh, today's presentation uh, will look uh, at the RNA sequencing overview, why it's important, as well as some of the challenges and considerations when performing RNA workflows. Additionally, we will look at the library preparation challenges associated with RNA sequencing from long multi-step protocols and ensuring accurate assessment of transcript orientation to the ability to detect and quantify all your RNA regions of interest. RNA-seq is the set of experimental procedures that generate cDNA sequences from all or some of the RNA molecules in your sample, followed by library construction and massively parallel deep sequencing to base pair resolution. RNA-seq helps us understand diseases and identify biomarkers and drug targets. And some of the other major goals of transcriptome sequencing uh, is measuring gene expression, for example, during various stages of development or under different conditions, such as different stressors, discovering and annotating transcripts, including novel transcripts, and the detection of alternative splicing events and post-translational modifications. The transcriptome is a collection of RNAs in a cell that has been transcribed from genomic DNA. We know that with humans, the transcriptome represents 85% of the genome. Of that amount, only 3% that encodes for protein coding genes. The rest consists of non-coding and regulatory RNA and less informative ribosomal and transfer RNA. There are many types of RNA species uh, present in a given total RNA sample. Messenger RNA, like I said, which serves as the template for uh, protein synth synthesis. Ribosomal RNA, uh, which forms uh, the ribosome to assist with translation of the mRNA into proteins. And transfer RNA, which is transporting those amino acids to facilitate protein synthesis. In addition to that, we have non-coding RNA, um, which is not protein coding, uh, but has been shown to play an important role in gene expression such as long non-coding, uh, microRNAs, small interfering RNAs, and, and many others. So one of the, some of the challenges with RNA in of itself. Uh, RNA library preparation uh, can, can be simply uh, handle, uh, you know, difficult with sample handling uh, and your workstation decontamination. Uh, an RNA-free environment is essential when working with RNA samples. In the laboratory, obtaining full-length, high-quality RNA can be challenging. And there are two main reasons for RNA degradation during RNA analysis. Uh, first, RNA, uh, by its very structure, is inherently weaker than DNA. RNA is made up of ribose units, uh, which have a highly reactive hydroxyl group on C2 that takes uh, part in RNA-mediated enzymatic events. This makes RNA more chemically li uh, labile than DNA. RNA is more prone uh, to heat degradation uh, than DNA, and that's why we want to store it in a minus 80 freezer and minimize the amount of freeze-thaw cycles, as well as keeping your RNA on ice, unless otherwise noted in a workflow that you are working with. Secondly, enzymes that degrade RNA or your ribonucleases or RNases are so ubiquitous and hardy that removing them often proves to be nearly impossible. If you were to autoclave a solution containing a bacteria, you would destroy that and the bacterial cell, but not the RNases released from that cell. And even trace amounts of RNases are able to degrade RNA. 
Therefore, it's essential to avoid inadvertently introducing RNases into the RNA sample during or after isolation procedure and ensure that your workstation is decontaminated. And if at ever possible, try and work in an RNA hood. Um, the stability of the sample and proper handling, such as not avoiding uh, vortexing your RNA sample and wearing gloves and using sterile plasticware are all easy ways to help work with your RNA sample. The assessment of the input are of the RNA sample is important in order to determine sequencing workflow parameters and triaging your sample sets. Uh, when obtaining the highest quality data from degraded samples, uh, you want to be able to assess uh, where you would like to adjust for your protocol to maximize your throughput of those samples. Uh, it can be perceived as a challenge as low input and quality may reduce library yields and complexity and also increase your adapter dimer rates, all while reducing coverage uniformity and might require those further optimizations. Uh, fluorometric assays are recommended to qualify, or excuse me, quantify your RNA as they generally provide a more sensitive measurement of your nucleic acid concentrations compared to other methods such as uh, spectrophotometric, excuse me, spectrophotometric methods. With regards to sample quality, two metrics frequently used to evaluate RNA quality uh, based on a sample's electrophoretic trace includes the RNA integrity number or the RIN number and the DV200 value. Here's a representative trace of high quality UHR sample or universal human reference. The RIN score is automatically tabulated by the Agilent expert software for their bioanalyzer, which commutes, computes the ratio of ribosomal peaks and the presence of degraded product to assign an integrity number. Samples with a RIN greater than or equal to seven are considered higher quality. And in contrast, RNA extracted from FFP samples typically lack distinctive ribosomal peaks, and that impacts the relevance of that RIN score as a quality metric for degraded samples. In this case, the DV200 value is much more informative. The RNA fragments shorter than 200 nucleotides are poor substrates for RNA-seq library construction and are unlikely to contribute to that final library. And so the DV200 metric uh, quantifies the percentage of your entire RNA sample and will measure how much of that is above 200 nucleotides in length. And you can see here on these bottom two, everything highlighted in two is greater uh, than 200 nucleotides in length. And so while the RIN scores are similar for both, the DV200 metric actually shows that the, the FFP sample on the left is much higher quality given the higher percentage of fragments larger than 200 nucleotides, despite having a lower RIN score. And the metric on the right could be, uh, excuse me, the, the figure on the right could be deemed a lower quality FFP due to the lower DV200 score. Uh, the DV200 values are more broadly distributed um, and suggest that the FFP derived sample on the left is that higher quality. So in this section, uh, I'm gonna discuss the library prep challenges uh, that may be avoided simply by choosing optimal chemistries for your RNA-seq workflow. And with that, we'll cover challenges such as choosing the proper workflow for your desired results, uh, the ability to assess transcript orientation uh, to improving detection of your RNA of interest. Although it's possible to bioinformatically remove unwanted RNA reads from your final sequencing data, such as in silico depletion, um, you, you are removing quality sequencing reads. 
um, and, and reducing your analysis resources. So instead, it is preferable uh, to remove rRNA from the sample prior to library preparation. And two methods to accomplish this are mRNA capture or ribodepletion. In mRNA capture workflows, uh, the transcripts that are polyadenylated at the three prime end are selected over other species through a poly A capture process where the mature mRNA is then used as the input to library prep. And since our RNA does not contain a poly A tail, our RNA sequences uh, are greatly reduced in the sequencing data. In ribodepletion workflows, the rRNA is directly removed from the total RNA sample itself, leaving the transcripts of interest available for sequencing, including your non-coding precursor transcripts in addition to all of your other mature and immature mRNA. And so what are the advantages and disadvantages of each of these methods? mRNA capture workflows are shorter and simpler than ribodepletion workflows. And because these libraries only contain polyadenylated transcripts, they require less sequencing to achieve the same coverage depth compared to ribosomal depleted libraries for those exonic regions. However, this method is suitable only for high quality RNA. Uh, and even then introduces more three prime bias because you're selecting for that three prime end. Uh, than ribodepletion. Ribodepletion, on the other hand, uh, is compatible with degraded inputs such as FFPE and provides a better five prime coverage and gives a more holistic overview of the entire transcriptome. However, given the lower amount or percentage of exonic regions, it could require more sequencing in comparison uh, to mRNA-seq for those uh, uh, expressed regions. And so we'll cover that here, uh, looking at the breakdown of those different uh, regions of RNA samples. So if you were to sequence a total RNA-seq library without any of those upfront enrichments that we discussed, uh, this is the expected distribution of your sequencing reads. As you can see, over 90% of the reads map to the ribosomal RNA. And you could note that from the electrophoretic traces that we saw, the two abundant peaks of RNA in your samples. The remaining 10% is divided between intergenic, intronic, and exonic RNA content. Because ribosomal RNA is not generally of biological interest for most researchers, this means that over 90% of the sequencing capacity is being wasted by sequencing molecules that are not of interest. One way to improve sequencing uh, throughput is to remove the undesirable ribosomal species prior to library de uh, depletion uh, through those RNA enrichment methods that we discussed. So if we bioinformatically remove all the reads mapping to the ribosomal loci, the ratio between intergenic, intronic, and exonic reads are dispersed as such. mRNA-seq is traditionally the more widely used method for RNA enrichment, again, due to its fast workflow and its low per reaction cost. The RNA sample is incubated with those beads uh, coated in oligo DT, and that is what hybridized to the, to the poly A tail of the mature mRNA. And so in comparison to this in silico depleted sample, the mRNA capture process intentionally biases the read distribution towards those exonic or those protein coding regions. And that is at the expense, however, of those intergenic and intronic reads. The intergenic and intronic reads are of particular interest for many researchers as these regions uh, contain many non-coding transcripts which have been shown to affect gene regulation uh, through a variety of DNA, RNA, RNA to RNA, or protein RNA interactions. And so a second option is to perform that ribosomal depletion. And with the kappa riboerase module, you're specifically depleting the ribosomal material by hybridizing the sample with DNA oligos, targeting the RNA regions, and enzymatically depleting them. 
resulting in a read distribution that's very similar to the in silico depleted sample. And if you note that if you are primarily interested in the exonic content, you need to increase the sequencing depth of the rRNA depleted library preparation compared to the mRNA seq to get an e uh, you know equivalent coverage. So in, in addition to research of interest in sequencing economy, an additional factor is the choice of the RNA enrichment strategy based on sample quality. And as I had mentioned, all of these workflows can be used and are suitable for high quality samples for all three strategies. However, due to the inherent nature of the mRNA capture workflow, it is not recommended to have uh, to process low quality samples through mRNA capture due to the impact on sequencing coverage and the impact on a three prime bias. So why is RNA-seq stranded preferred? So in a cell, each single stranded RNA is synthesized from one of the two strands of DNA. When RNA is copied back into cDNA for RNA-seq in the lab, the information about which of the two strands of DNA was copied into RNA can be lost unless a stranded library prep method is used, which creates challenges unless strand information is preserved. And so strand-specific RNA, uh, RNA-seq improves on the, the standard RNA-seq in, in a few ways. Accurately identifying the antisense transcripts, determining the transcribed strand of non-coding RNAs, and demarcating the boundaries of closely situated or overlapping genes. And it's, it's I want to mention here too that our Kappa stranded kit and also our Kappa RNA hyper are both stranded workflows um, and, and have benefits over the standard RNA-seq workflows. So mentioning our Kappa stranded kit, I'd like to go over some of the improvements that we've made on our library prep workflow to combat the long multi-step workflows of RNA-seq. So one of the challenges with these long multi-step workflows is that with each transfer step, the likelihood of contamination or sample loss increases. And from a timing perspective, it can also become a challenge to complete the process in a, in a full working day. So this is a schematic of our first generation RNA-seq workflow. After optimal RNA enrichment, the RNA is chemically fragmented and randomly primed for first strand synthesis, then converted into double-stranded cDNA through our second strand synthesis and marking. Stranded information is preserved through the marking of that second strand, uh, and that's by incorporating uracils. And then this is followed by A-tailing adapter ligation, uh, which is a part of your core library construction. And then two post-ligation cleanups to ensure removal of any adapter dimer that might be present. And then the final step is amplification with our Kappa Hi-Fi polymerase for your high efficiency and low bias PCR. Uh, the polymerase stalls whenever it encounters a uracil, and as a result, only amplifies that first strand, thereby maintaining that stranded information. And after amplification and cleanup, the library is ready for sequencing. And so what we've done is when we've introduced this RNA hyper prep kit, we've optimized and combined the second strand synthesis and a tailing reaction and overall reduction of the incubation time itself. And by combining these, we've eliminated the cleanup step between those two enzymatic uh, processes. These modifications reduce the overall working time by approximately two hours and allow library preparation inclusive of those upfront enrichments to be completed in under an eight hour workday. And note that for either workflow, uh, the upstream RNA enrichment modules remain the same uh, workflows as, as we discussed previously. 
Uh, one important element for any library preparation is to use high quality efficient enzymes that exhibit low bias across AT or GC rich regions. Library preparation uh, for next generation sequencing often involves uh, an amplification step for obtaining fragments enriched for adaptive ligated ends and for increasing the library size, both of which are essential uh, for effective detection of sequencing during uh, of, of sequences during your sequencing run. However, PCR can often introduce bias in some samples, leading to potential underrepresentation uh, under of certain fragments in a sequencing read. Uh, but all of our kits contain our Kappa Hi-Fi DNA polymerase, a novel enzyme that was engineered through our directed evolution technology for ultra high fidelity and robustness. And the Kappa Hi-Fi improves the overall sequencing quality and low amplification bias for more uniform coverage of difficult regions for sequencing, lowering duplication rates compared to other options, and amplifies NGS libraries with high quality fidelity. And at times, the processing of samples with NGS workflows, such as RNA or even DNA library prep or target enrichment, the methods used can sometimes capture uh, the more GC prevalent regions due to the affinity of the bases and lead to what we deem as a GC uh, G of GC rich regions. And it's important to produce minimal coverage bias to avoid the need for additional sequencing coverage, regardless of what workflow is being used. Efficient amplification of GC and AT rich fragments and transcriptome provides the ability to have better five prime to three prime coverage as shown in these top graphs. Additionally, with the improved engineering of our preparation enzymes, it allows for better coverage for difficult regions as well. And displayed is the, in the genomic coordinate graphs on the bottom, you can see that our uh, Kappa RNA hyper in both the mRNA capture and ribosomal depletion captures more uh, than the competitors seen here. To further outline the benefits of enrichment strategies for reducing sequencing waste, I wanted to highlight our riborase workflow for ribodepletion. Uh, the data in the following slides utilize this specific workflow, so I just wanted to touch on uh, the steps involved with our ribodepletion using riborase. So beginning with your total RNA, uh, you have your uh, desired RNA present as well as your rRNA. And we're going to hybridize uh, DNA oligos to the rRNA of various species for human, mouse, and rat. I will note too that we do have an additional workflow called riborase and uh, plus globin, which also has probes that can be spiked in if working with uh, whole blood libraries, uh, since the globin mRNA can be quite prevalent as well and add to any sequencing waste due to it not providing much information uh, for uh, your whole blood RNA libraries. And so after we bind our oligos to our uh, um, undesired regions, um, we're going to use uh, an enzymatic reaction with RNase H. And what that will do is, is chew away any RNA that is present in a DNA RNA hybrid. And after that, we're gonna have the oligos present in our reaction, and we'll just conduct a Kappa pure bead cleanup to purify the sample and remove any, any material from the previous reaction. And what's left is your desired RNA and the DNA oligos used in the rRNA depletion. And so what we'll do is we're going to digest any of those DNA probes using DNase one. And finally, uh, purify in one last Kappa pure bead cleanup and proceed with our desired RNA in our Kappa RNA hyper workflow. One way that we can evaluate 
ribodepletion strategies impact on uh, reducing that sequencing waste is to look at the efficiency of the depletion methods. Here we're showing uh, the delta CT scores of samples processed using our enzymatic depletion workflows, uh, riborase, compared to samples processed with a competitor bead-based depletion workflow. The delta CT score is a metric based on the uh, excuse me, quantitative change of ribosomal 28S regions of the original input RNA to that of the depleted sample. The dashed gray line in, uh, corresponds to a delta CT of seven. And you'll notice that enzymatic depletion is generally more effective and less affected by the sample quality, such as UHR, high quality FFPE, or low quality FFPE, compared to the bead-based workflow. A 28S delta CT of seven theoretically reflects to about 99% rRNA depletion. Of course, PCR is rarely 100% efficient, and we are only measuring for depletion of one RNA spe R RNA species when several rRNAs are targeted by riborase. And with that, we evaluate how well our QRT-PCR assay can predict successful global rRNA depletion by comparing delta CT values for 28S rRNA measured by our QRT-PCR to the percent of total rRNA reads obtained after RNA sequencing for 47 libraries. A strong correlation was observed and a measured delta CT of greater than or equal to seven correlated with a low rRNA score of less than 5% of the reads for those samples. In contrast, a delta CT less than seven correlated with higher rRNA or greater than 5% of the reads. And noting that all libraries exhibiting, exhibiting greater than 5% rRNA reads were prepared using the competitor workflow that employs a bead-based strategy for the removal of rRNA. So in this section, I wanted to present how using RNA hyper prep can further reduce RNA-seq challenges by having the ability to detect and quantify all of your RNAs of, of research interest. In doing so, I will present data from library sequence to using Illumina HiSeq 2500 uh, with V4 chemistry. Here's the information on the experimental design. Uh, adapter and rRNA reads were quantified and removed from further analysis. When quantifying the percent rRNA reads, neither sample quality nor quantity affected the efficiency of depletion with, your, with the riborase workflow. All samples exhibited less than 2% rRNA reads. And for adapter dimer rates, both the UHR and high quality sample showed less than 5% adapter dimer carryover. Though noting that the rates started to creep up uh, for the high quality sample at the lower input. But in contrast, uh, very high adapter dimer rates were observed with the low quality samples. Uh, this sample was processed using the standard conditions rather than conditions that were optimized to reduce the adapter dimer. And this is because we wanted to directly compare the effect of sample quality on sequencing metrics using the standard conditions that you would use in our user's guide. And after removal of the rRNA and adapter dimer reads, high quality reads were aligned and subsampled to 14 million reads uh, per sample and transcripts per million counts were normalized and quantified. So looking on the left, we see the post ligation yield data, which shows us the properly adapter ligated cDNA fragment uh, and the concentrations of your sequencing, sequenceable libraries before amplification. Uh, and especially with the 100 nanogram sample input, you see the drastic difference in concentration after ligation. And during preparation, however, all these samples were amplified to have similar concentrations going into sequencing so that we could minimize uh, the variation of pooling. And on the right, we've identified a few important R RNA sequencing metrics. 
mapped reads to ensure the reads of the sample are aligned, are aligning properly to the species of interest. Uh, duplicates provide uh, an understanding of complexity of the, the conditions. Mean CV describes the evenness of coverage. The lower the number, the more complete the coverage across the transcriptome and less variation uh, and transcripts detected. And despite the vast difference in concentration after ligation and an expected difference in duplication due to the varying amplification parameters of the sample types and the small effect on uh, coverage variation, there is a similar amount of transcripts detected for these different sample types. And this is a, an example of the robustness of the RNA hyper workflow to identify your transcripts of interest from low yielding, low quality samples. And here we take a look at the reproducibility, excuse me, reproducibility of replicates in, um, in the high quality and low quality samples at 25 nanograms and 100 nanograms. And as you can see with the RIN score, very high quality reproducibility between replicates. Uh, while this shows that gene expression analysis for FFPE samples using the RNA prep uh, with riborase workflow is reproducible, we also wanted to uh, look at how accurate uh, the assessment of these transcripts were. So to address accuracy, libraries were prepared uh, from matched pairs of fresh frozen and FFP tumor samples. The fresh frozen RNA sample exhibited what we call a partially degraded electrophoretic profile with a low RIN score because of the less uh, pronounced ribosomal peaks, uh, but a relatively high DV200 value. The matched FFP sample also exhibited a high DB200, but note the circle around the high molecular weight bump observed in the sample, and it's otherwise greatly degraded, but in some cases, this high molecular weight uh, might reflect material that's cross-linked or was incompletely deparaffinized rather than actual intact RNA, and it might cause an inflated DB200. So if we look at the comparison between competitor workflows for these samples, libraries prepared using Kappa RNA hyperprep exhi exhibited better correlation between the FFPE sample and its fresh frozen counterpart. And this provides confidence in the performance and accuracy of FFPE samples in a streamlined workflow. And in comparison to the competitor workflows, library prepared, uh, libraries prepared with the Kappa workflow exhibited better coverage balance, particularly, particularly for fresh frozen samples. And note that our riborase module, as well as that from vendor B, are both enzymatic and exhibited better depletion efficiencies than vendor A, which uses a bead-based approach. The Kappa workflow also identified more unique transcripts than the competitor workflows, which has a significant implication on gene expression profiling. For this normal versus tumor, normal versus tumor assessment, the Kappa workflow again identified more unique transcripts than the competitor workflows, which allowed for the detection of more differentially expressed transcripts with a two-fold change minimum at a p-value of less than 0.05. RNA hyper identified up to 40% more differentially expressed transcripts than the competitors. When we increase stringency to a p-value of less than or equal to 0.001, RNA hyper identified nearly five-fold more differentially expressed transcripts. We examined the overlap of the identified transcripts and found that RNA hyper workflow identified nearly all the differentially expressed transcripts identified by the competitor workflows, as well as an additional 299. In contrast, only 41 transcripts are identified 
by the competitors, but not by Kappa. And additionally, we found that two of the 41 transcripts identified by co uh, uh, competitor workflows are protein coding. The remaining are mostly small nucleolar RNA species. And in contrast for Kappa, 174 protein coding transcripts are identified exclusively by that workflow. Many of these corresponding to genes that are frequently uh, dysregulated in breast cancer. And next we wanted to determine if the differentially expressed transcripts identified by Kappa only could be validated using an independent method or if they reflect an RNA-seq artifact that's specific for this Kappa workflow. And so the validation of differential gene regulation results were performed using a Roche custom real-time ready qPCR assay, excuse me, qPCR array. Uh, Briefly, total RNA from normal and tumor samples is converted to cDNA, then combined with a qPCR master mix and applied to the real-time ready plate that contains primers for individual targets of interest in each well. Transcripts are quantified using standard qPCR uh, and data du from duplicate plates are normalized and analyzed to identify differential expression. The layout of our custom design includes three reference, reference genes for normalization shown in light gray, five controls for the reverse transcriptase reaction shown in dark gray, 10 assays highlighted in white were included for transcripts that were identified as differentially expressed by multiple workflows. These serve as uh, positive controls as we have high confidence that they will be true differentially expressed transcripts. The remaining 78 uh, target transcripts identified as differentially expressed by Kappa RNA hyperprep only. These assays were selected to represent a range of fold changes and p-values as measured by RNA-seq. The heat map style of coloring indicates targets that are upregulated in the tumor sample in red and downregulated targets in blue with a darkness of color reflecting the magnitude of the change. Here we've split the data in, into two graphs, one for the upregulated targets in red and the downregulated targets in blue. The fold change values obtained by RNA-seq are plotted on the y-axis. Note that the axis starts at two because all targets were selected based on having a minimal fold change of two. And qPCR data is plotted on the x-axis. The dashed line is drawn to mark a fold change of two measured by qPCR. All points to the right of the line are targets that validated by that were validated by qPCR with a full change of greater than or equal to two. Note that all 10 positive controls, control transcripts identified by multiple RNA-seq workflows and are indicated here uh, with the lighter circles. They were validated as differentially expressed by qPCR. Only two transcripts or 3% of the total showed no change between the samples by qPCR. Seven targets trended correctly, but did not reach the twofold change cutoff. And 87% of Kappa only targets validated as differentially expressed with a greater than or equal to twofold change by qPCR. And these results offer an independent validation that the differentially expressed transcripts identified by the Kappa workflow uh, reflect, reflect measurable change in gene expression, and they're not RNA-seq artifacts. And it's worth noting that a number of the transcripts identified by Kappa only are part of the gene classifier sets that separates breast cancers into molecular subtypes and are often used as prognostic indicators. 
And these suggest that the differential expression identified by Kappa is not only accurate, but relevant to disease research. And we're very excited by these results uh, and are currently trying to determine um, why these targets were identified uh, by Kappa only. And lastly, just to touch on the, the final part of RNA-seq is the analysis and the backend process of RNA sequencing. And so we've partnered with Genialis and they are a data analysis software company that can assist in a number of facets such as detecting sample reproducibility, comparing the expression levels detected in your samples and possibly understand the gene regulation. And so with that, I'll summarize some of the four main take homes for RNA sequencing uh, resources. RNA sequencing in of itself provides a dynamic view of the genome by measuring gene expression at various uh, time points and can enable transcript dis discovery and annotation, as well as capturing alternative splicing events and those post-translational modifications, uh, as well as identifying mutations and gene fusions. Sample handling is always critical when processing RNA samples. Um, always ensuring that you store them properly. It's always best to store them in a minus 80 freezer and avoid freeze thaws whenever possible and keeping on ice as, as best as you can, unless otherwise noted by the workflow itself. Avoid vortexing and always ensure to assess your RNA quality and quantity before sample processing. Stranded workflows provide better ability to identify antisense transcripts and non-coding RNA with that stranded workflow, as well as our workflow will save time and reduce steps with that streamlined RNA-seq, RNA hyper prep workflow, and the ability to choose between two enrichment options with our mRNA capture and ribosomal depletion using riborase, all which can flow uh, into the RNA hyperprep workflow. And with sequencing performance, always try and reduce your sequencing waste uh, by efficient, efficiently depleting or uh, leaving behind your rRNA uh, substrates unless they are of interest to your research, as well as the ability to identify abundant unique transcripts using your sequencing uh, pipeline or using the offering that Genialis provides. And with that, for any information uh, about our RNA-seq portfolio, uh, you can visit our RNA website. And for any questions that you might have for workflow considerations or input considerations, feel free to contact our sequencing support team. They're always here to help uh, and they're really a, a great team and, and always tries to um, really make the best out of your sample. So thank you again for the time today uh, and we'll open it up to any questions.